here. Okay, okay. Okay, so hi everyone. Thanks so much for being here today. Um, my name is Lua, uh, and today I have the pleasure to have two people here that they are working on using um, natural history collections to study um, evolutionary ecology. So the first speaker is going to be Catherine Turner. Um, I have the pleasure to know Catherine really well. We did um, both our postdoc at Pennsylvania State University. But before getting there, Catherine got her PhD at University of British Columbia. And then she did a first postdoc at Colorado State University and then at Penn State. She's currently an assistant professor at Idaho State University, and her focus is on ecological genetics of invasive plant species, trying to understand genetic mechanisms that facilitate um, invasiveness. And today she's going to be telling us about one of her most research pro uh, recent projects, and I'm like super excited to hear about it, and I hope you enjoy it. Catherine, it's all yours. All right. Okay. So, right, thanks for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Um, whoops, what's happened here? Okay. So today I am going to talk about some sort of ongoing work that I started as a postdoc um, and I'm continuing at my new lab at Idaho State. 2020 has been, uh, let's say an interesting year to try to get a lab up and running. And I want to warn you in advance that this talk is, you know, sort of light on results and heavy on optimistic planning. Um, but first, let's get into the weeds. Uh, so this is a photo of an agricultural field in Wyoming, which is infested with an invasive plant called blue mustard. Uh, this is a crop weed that I'm going to tell you a lot more about later on in the talk. Um, and when I see a landscape like this, which is dominated by a single species, that's one we didn't actually intend to put there, I get really curious. I wanna know what the heck's going on. And that leads me to my motivating question, which is how do invasive plants succeed in novel environments? And by invasive species in this context, I mean a non-native species which adversely affects the habitats that they invade. So invasive plants are hugely successful at moving into and dominating new environments. Um, and they're additionally a very expensive problem that threaten natural and agricultural systems. And what you see here is a, a spring in New Mexico, both before and after salt cedar invasion. And you can see that the introduction of this species has really dramatically altered the landscape, um, reducing the open water available for use by an endangered fish in this case. And you might expect that it would be difficult or even, or even impossible for a small population introduced to a completely novel environment far outside its native range to survive or thrive and yet in some cases this does happen. So understanding the conditions and the mechanisms that enable them to do this could really open the door to improved management and prevention efforts. Invasions are also these really great evolutionary test cases. With invasions, we can ask questions about the role of standing genetic variation, admixture, or novel mutations in the process of adapting to novel environments. Some of the questions that we wanna understand are, are um, invasive species really invasive before they're even introduced? Are they, are they pre-adapted to similar environments? And that's what allows them to sort of hit the ground running. Or do introduced species evolve to be more invasive after introduction? And typically we try to answer these questions for a particular species by collecting individuals of that species from the native range and collecting individuals of that species from the invasive range and then comparing them and we say that the difference between the two groups is evolution that's occurred in the invaded range. And I've done this myself in previous work. But actually, can we make better comparisons? Because you see there's this problem of deciding, um, of comparing contemporary individuals from the two ranges and just assuming that the difference is evolution in the invaded range. First of all, we have to decide what the correct native population even is for that comparison. And that can be really complicated if multiple introductions are involved or if we lack detailed population genetic data. And additionally, it's not like evolution just stopped in the native range. 
environments are changing there as well. So ideally, we could observe the direct predecessors of the contemporary invasive populations that we're interested in. But what we need for that is, of course, a time machine. And in a way, that's what we have in the form of uh, natural history collections like, like this herbarium specimen. So natural history collections, of which herbaria are some of the largest and most accessible, have, have really provided us the big data that is the foundation of our historical baseline understanding of biodiversity and ecological change. They can offer us this time machine to understand how genetic diversity changes through time and, uh, how, and what the ecological communities of the past were like. Herbaria make their data accessible through digitization, and these efforts began with the primary data collected by the original collector. So that's the, the label information and, the, and the, the specimen itself, the image of the specimen. Um, but what I think is really exciting is that more data can be collected from these specimens many years after they were collected. So some approaches um, to producing this novel data are reliant on the physical specimen, or sorry, are not reliant on the physical specimen, but instead use a, a digital representation to, to collect more data. Other novel data can be produced from the physical specimen as well. And later on, I'll talk more about all the different uses that I can imagine for um, a specimen like, a, like an herbarium specimen. But one of the many kinds of data I can get from an herbarium specimen is genomic. And across multiple specimens, all this data is temporally ordered. So using the temporal nature of this genomic data, we can understand key population events in the history of a plant invasion. With this time separated genomic data, we can actually like sort of watch genetic variation as it changes through time and as the species spreads across novel environment. So for just a handful of invasive species, we have an idea of the levels of variation that exist in contemporary populations. So we can see this sort of endpoint. But by using the historic record, we can start to understand hidden patterns. So something we really like to know, for example, is what triggers an invasion. Does an invasive species just start to spread as soon as it gets here, um, as soon as it arrives in a new habitat? So did just a single population show up in the new range, and that's all that it took for it to immediately start to spread? That's sort of the simplest case I can imagine. Um, uh, you might call that a continuous population model. Or as is often thought to be the case, is there a lag phase uh, before the invasion really takes off? And then what causes that lag phase to end? Perhaps multiple populations are introduced and then a, a sorting occurs such that only the best suited genotypes remain, replacing all the others. It could be then that this replacement event is what ends the lag period and starts and kicks off the invasion. Or possibly populations could admix, increasing the genetic variation available uh, in the invaded range. And then it would be this admixture event that ends the lag period. And of course, some combination of these events could also occur. But for most invasive species, there's just like a lot of unknowns, um, too many unknowns to really get at these types of questions. And that's where herbarium genomics really comes in. So for my focal invader, I'm uh, starting this work with Corospora tenella or blue mustard. It's also known as musk mustard because it's really quite smelly. It smells like mm, maybe a barnyard. And a few things um, about this species make it really the perfect focus for this work. First of all, it's a problematic weed. It invades winter annual cereal crop fields like winter wheat and alfalfa and can really reduce the, um, the crop production in those fields. Uh, it also can taint uh, uh, milk produced by dairy animals that eat it. Um, it can make, give it a funny uh, flavor and color. And it's also a weed of arid rangelands and roadsides, so it can invade um, relatively undisturbed systems as well. It's invasive in North America, so the species is native to Eastern Europe, but also the Balkan Peninsula, Turkey, Iran, Mongolia, Northwestern China, and Northern India. And it's now and found in uh, across North America. It's been observed in 31 states and three Canadian provinces, including basically everywhere uh, west of the Mississippi River. It's also well represented in North American herbaria. So it was introduced when uh, during a time period when it could have been collected by botanists throughout its invasion history. So it was first introduced around the early 1900s. And they did indeed collect it. So shown here is the cumulative count of herbarium specimens for the species collected in North America. And these are just the ones that are listed in this single large database, GBIF. Uh, 
So this is actually an underestimate of true herbarium holdings. And finally, it has some really um, convenient characteristics from a genomics perspective. Uh, it has, because it's re closely related to uh, everyone's favorite model plant, Arabidopsis thaliana, it has significant genomic resources available. It is a diploid with a small genome, so roughly twice the size of Arabidopsis. And it's an annual, which means it's had more opportunity for recombination to occur in the invaded range which possibly gives us the ability to identify causal genes underlying selective sweeps in this species. So given these characteristics, this work has the potential to be especially informative um, and may even allow us to drill down to the functional level to understand how this species has evolved since introduction. So to help my genomic analyses along and to make sure I even know what I'm looking at in the herbarium sequence data, I need a reference genome. Compared to DNA extracted from fresh tissue, ancient DNA is typically uh, weaker, more fragmented, and has characteristic damage patterns. And without a reference to compare to, when I looked at the sequencing data from the herbarium specimens, I wouldn't really know if I was detecting corospora or, or DNA from some other species like a, like a bacterial contaminant. So I put together a first draft reference genome assembly, which still needs some polishing for sure. And I got the DNA for this assembly from uh, an individual I grew up from a USA germplasm population, which was originally collected in, in part of the native range. So once I had this draft assembly in hand, I could proceed with the herbarium specimen work. And first I needed to see just how many herbarium specimens I could actually get my hands on. And it turns out it was kind of a lot. So with the help of just uh, nine herbaria, I was able to sample leaf tissue from about 750 specimens, which were widely distributed across the Western US and parts of Canada. And there's definitely more out there that I'm always eager to um, continue to sample. Each of these specimens represents not only a point on a geographic map, but also a point in time and in environmental space. So really the ultimate goal of this work is to understand the invasion process across these several dimensions. Um, here I've shown you sample density in my data set, which has been roughly by decade. Um, up here in the corner. So the early specimen that I've sampled dates back to 1916 and is from Boulder, Colorado. But within a few years on either side of that specimen, there's also uh, exist herbarium specimens collected from Washington State and from New York, suggesting that there may have been a few separate introductions of this species. Um, but to know for sure, I need genomic data. So with the help of collaborators at the Max Planck in Tubingen, including the next speaker, Rafal uh, I got to pull on this very fashionable outfit. And we produced uh, sequencing libraries from 20 herbarium specimens, ranging in time from 1941 to 1993. We then sequenced to low coverage, getting about 10% of the genome back to look for patterns of ancient DNA damage and non-target species contamination. And this is what we found. So the y-axis here is number of reads, and each bar represents an herbarium specimen with two uh, library blanks on the end here. The dark brown color indicates that the majority of reads map to my modern course for assembly, so contamination was relatively low. We also checked for common uh, ancient DNA damage patterns, such as uh, C to T conversion, and we found relatively little damage as well. So since the low coverage libraries all looked pretty good, uh, I sent them off for much higher coverage sequencing around 33, uh, 33x. And that's the data I'm working with now. These analyses are, are still ongoing. Uh, so unfortunately, I don't have further results to show you here. However, I wanted to talk a bit about where I'm taking this project and what a rich data source herbaria and natural history collections in general can be. So to return to my motivating question, I want to know how invasive plants succeed in novel environments. So far, I've told you how herbarium specimens have allowed me to investigate how plant genotypes change over the course of an invasion. And I couldn't do this without collections. The time series sampling available from herbaria is just really unparalleled. But of course, plant genomic data isn't the only kind of information I can get from an herbarium specimen. Herbarium spe uh, specimens are really awesome. They're these like beautiful nuggets of data. So I tried to come up with a few other ways that they could help me address my main question. And of course, there's a, a lot of information on the label of a specimen. Here's an example. Particularly useful is this information about uh, 
individual's abiotic environment. And we can use just this information from the label to address questions about how species are distributed across the landscape and through climatic environments. So this approach is particularly powerful when combined with large environmental data sets. For example, using occurrence data taken from herbarium specimen labels and combining that with environmental data taken from satellite images, my collaborators and I were able to look at where species in a particular genus occurred on the landscape and associate that with drought frequencies in those locations. In this study, we found that annual species in the mustard genus Heliophila were more, uh, more likely to occur in areas that are prone to drought at a time of year when the annual plants are in their seed phase, so they're avoiding drought, and that perennial plants in this genus are more likely to occur in locations that are less prone to drought. So this particular study was in a genus native to the study area, but I think it illustrates how useful herbarium specimen label data alone can be to understanding the abiotic environments that species encounter. I'm also trying to connect historic patterns with genetic vari variation we observe in contemporary populations. Uh, and I can use the label data from herbarium specimens to really focus my collecting efforts. So the counties that I've highlighted on this map are where my herbarium collections um, from Corus boratinella are, are most concentrated in, in blue, or oldest in yellow, or both in green. And the black triangles represent contemporary populations that I've already sampled, but I'd like to go and collect further. Having these contemporary populations will help me draw conclusions about how things have changed over time. With a contemporary population, I can sample more individuals than you know, are, is typically possible with herbarium specimens, um, which can be helpful for population genetic analyses. Not that long ago, I got some sequencing data back for several of these contemporary populations um, and I'm going to use that to see how contemporary populations are related to each other and also to historical populations. Also, I can get seeds from contemporary populations and I can grow them up in, in common environments, which uh, will ulti ultimately allow me to associate phenotypic variation with, with genetic variation. So if I want to answer my question, in addition to looking at genetic change during invasion, I can also use herbarium specimens to look at how the, the geography and the abiotic environments that the invader encounters uh, change during the course of the invasion. So we can get genotype and abiotic environment data from herbarium specimens, but we also have the individual like right there, so we can also get data about its phenotype. I've been working with Mason Heverling at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History to see what we can learn from the phenotypic data preserved in the herbarium record of uh, my focal invader, Corus boratinella. And we're interested in changes in phenotypes that occur over the course of the invasion or in association with novel habitats. So here I've shown you just some of the raw data that we're working with to understand what time of year Corus borata starts to produce fruit. Um, and this work is also still ongoing. Okay, so we can get uh, genotype and we can get environment or environmental data and we can get phenotypic data um, and we can see how the how in genotype and environment interact to produce the phenotype. Uh, but wait, there's more because the abiotic environment alone doesn't perfectly describe the novel habitats that an invader encounters. Of course, there's also a whole complex system of novel biotic interactions that an invader has to contend with, which may you know enable or, or resist invasion. And I'm hoping that herbarium specimens can help us understand this as well. So one exciting possibility is that we can use herbarium specimens to understand the historical microbiome associated with invasion. By sequencing um, endophytes or the microbiome that lives on the surface of the plant or even uh, a surface, uh, sorry, soil microbes, we might be able to observe microbial communities that co-invade, act as facilitators, or, or even um, might act as future biocontrol candidates for the species. So with uh, my collaborators at Penn State, we were awarded a seed grant um, to start to expand um, this course for our work in this direction. The, the lab work for this project was actually scheduled to begin in the ancient DNA lab at Penn State last spring. And unfortunately, 2020 had other plans so we're really hoping to get this work started uh, by the end of the year. Using genomic data from herbarium specimens 
uh, metagenomic data, really, we're going to uh, explore the historical uh, uh, my historic micro microbial community using a pipeline developed by Laura Weirich, which identifies bacteria, archaea, viruses, and microbial eukaryotes from uh, ancient metagenomic, metagenomic data sets using a data database of over 130,000 uh, full microbial reference genomes. So because time damages all things, including DNA, we can use the characteristic damage patterns of ancient DNA to separate modern contaminant microorganisms from historic uh, microbial reads. And in this way, we can start to understand, you know, at least a slice of the biotic environment that it invading experienced over the course of an invasion. Okay, so to answer my question, how do invasive plants succeed in novel environments? I think I can get like a lot of the answer from herbarium specimens. Uh, enabled by these collections and curators that have maintained these imp impressive resources over up to hundreds of years. Um, and these are resources that I'm building my career on. So just briefly, I want to talk about some work I start, I'm starting at Idaho State. Uh, when I joined the faculty of Idaho State, I, I also joined the NSF EBSCOR funded multi-institutional and statewide GEM3 project. So that stands for Genes by Environment, uh, Modeling, Mechanisms, and Mapping. So in addition to my work trying to understand how invasive species succeed in the face of novel environments, I'm also going starting to look at how an iconic foundational native species, so big sagebrush, big sagebrush, sorry, um, and I'm trying to understand its adaptive capacity in the face of climate and land use change and, if, and invasive species, so also novel environments. And one of the first things I tried to do when I joined the GEM3 project was uh, you know, try to convince everyone that the, um, of the really important role that natural history, natural history collections can play in this project. Uh, one of the goals of GEM3 is to identify and understand the genetic and environmental mechanisms that contribute to adaptive and resilient species and landscapes. So I would like to use historical specimens to understand genetic change through time in big sagebrush. And it may be possible to associate genetic changes in particular populations with uh, historical ecosystem events, such as the introduction of an invasive species or land use change. And I may also be able to identify differences in microbiomes that are associated with resilient or extirpated populations uh, using these herbarium specimens. And I guess I was pretty convincing because my collaborators and I got a seed grant funded to better understand the role of the microbiome in sagebrush's adaptive capacity. My part of it will try to connect changes in leaf microbiome over the last century with plant genetics, uh, leaf stable isotopes and how they change through time, chemotypes, which is really important in sagebrush, the different chemotypes, um, and just the adaptive capacity of the species as a whole. So I'm really excited to get uh, this work started in ISU's um, fancy ancient DNA lab this spring. Okay, so with that, I'd like to thank my collaborators, especially the Iberia that I've worked with and my funders, and to thank you for listening. Awesome, thanks. Um, we have time for like maybe one or two questions. Either you can unmute yourself or you can type it on the chat. So go ahead. I have a quick question. Um, and this is kind of like, what's your opinion on? So we've been like, we talk about how all these herbarium specimens are now like digitalized and how we can use all that information. But where do you see things going in terms of like the sharing of all those genomic resources? Because we are gathering data, genomic data from the stuff that are a museum. So that data also belongs to the museums. So how do you think, in which direction you think things are going in that way? Like whose responsibility is it to host the genomic data? Yeah. Yeah, do, well, it would be nice if, they, if it could all be centrally located, but uh, natural history collections are like severely underfunded for that kind yeah. of work. And in fact, just the like label digitization effort is like such a monumental amount of, of work that their like plate is full um, for the next hundred years trying to get all that information accessible. So uh, I think it's 
I mean, personally, I would put it on like a like a, a short read archive or you know some sort of mm -hmm. genomic data uh, public database. But um, but then it gets disconnected from the ovarian specimen. So yeah, it's a problem. It and it's only going to become a bigger problem as we sequence more and more of these specimens. Yeah. So there are two questions in the chat. Rafael had one, which isotopes are you interested in and what would you like them to indicate? Right, so um, one of my collaborators has um, already looked at some, um, some really interesting patterns of uh, carbon and nitrogen isotopes from herbarium specimens in the American West. And he thinks that there may be an association with uh, climate change to decreasing nitrogen availability. I think mm -hmm. that's right. So you see this really sort of dramatic um, like uptick, downtick, a really dramatic change in the in the trajectory of this carbon to nitrogen ratio. Um, and so we're hoping to expand that into sagebrush um, specimens that we have even more information about, like we have their genomic information, for example. Cool. And there's one more. So Rachel says, fascinating, Catherine. I'm curious what parts of the plants you use for extractions and what did you think was most successful? Also, um, what extraction protocol you use? Right. Uh, so uh, leaf tissue is what I've used, but in some cases, you know, with a little individual, um, usually that's already not attached to the ovarian specimen that's loose, I would use just the whole individual because um, that seems like the most, I haven't tested it myself, but it seems like the most profitable tissue to use. And then the extraction protocol, uh, well, it's the one that Rafal taught me. <laughs> what was the name of that particular protocol? Do you remember, Rafal? Um, I will actually put a slide on that. Okay, so, so we're going to talk, talk if to you about Rachel it. can wait a second, then I, I'll Great. share that. Awesome, cool. So thanks again. Um, it was really awesome to have you here. So okay. Rafael, I will go ahead and share your um, presentation. Wait, give me one sec. Let me check. I actually managed to download it fine. Okay, give it a try. Um, you should be able to share I it. I promise, Catherine, I was listening to you at all times, but I downloaded it manually. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Right. So now you should be seeing the title slide. Is that correct? You have to put it in presentation mode, or we will see the whole PowerPoint. Gotcha. How is that looking? Perfect. Oh, excellent. Okay, so thanks a lot, Lua, for the invitation well, and for all I people who came to listen. I wrote a tiny introduction for you, the same way I did for Catherine. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. I wanted to give both of you kind of like a general introduction. So Rafael got his PhD at University of Warwick in the UK. Um, he was a postdoc at Max Planck Institute, the place where Catherine was also learning about all the ancient genomics. Um, he did a second postdoc, New York, refresh my memory, yeah. And he's currently yes. working in one of my favorite places in the world. He's working at the Royal Botanical Gardens of Kew in the UK. Um, he works in crop evolution and he uses historical and archaeological samples as well as living material. So I'm really excited to have you here um, and I look forward to hearing about your talk. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, for the invitation and for all the people who are here to listen. Um, I'll have to make very similar excuse to, to Catherine. Um, I, I did a probe, Lua, what would be the best topic to talk about? And uh, she encouraged me to talk a little bit more about the ongoing project. So um, again, there will be not as many results as I wish I could present, um, but I will reach out to some of my past work in, in, in some circumstances. So hopefully um, that will, for example, address the question about the extractions. So yeah, um, 
I wanted to start very broadly um, to talk about crop wild relatives. Like, why would we even care about crop wild relatives? And um, I will first make a claim that they are really pretty. And you can see the two cases in here, um, the photograph of the oats on the top and the crop wild relative of banana in the bottom. But the three mostly used um, rationale for, for studying crop wild relatives is, is its utility. So they are a great source of genetic diversity in general to broaden the base for breeding programs, but they're also sources of biotic and abiotic resistances in particular. So that has been exploited for uh, over a hundred years right now with some notable examples being, for example, in potato where a notorious pest Phytophthora uh, infestans uh, for example, was kept at bay through some um, introgressions, a, some viral, some uh, viral infections were kept at bay by um, introducing uh, genes from um, other Solanum species. And it, the story is almost the same in any crop you're looking at. So there would be resistances bred into, um, into rice as well to fight against Xanthomonas and many, many others, too many to, to list for sure. But there is two less commonly uh, put rationale in here, um, which I find particularly appealing, even though funders usually don't, so I still use the, the three sources. Uh, so one is we, we do care about wild plants and we should not think about crop wild relatives as crops. Um, they are also wild plants, they are growing around us and they are also threatened. Uh, frequently by, by many um, anthropogenic factors. So we, if we do care about wild plants and their conservation, we should definitely uh, also uh, take good care of our crop wild relatives. And finally, I want to highlight the fact that they do tell us an amazing amount of information about uh, the origins of our crops. And I will not be talking about that today in too much details, but these are just general drivers of my interest. So here I'll give you a couple of numbers that were recently published in this uh, Global Rescue Report, which is a joint effort by um, Millennium Seed Bank at, at Q and um, Crop Trust, which was generously funded by Norwegian government. So in this re report, we can read that in total, there is between 50, in the world, so that's not, and 70 percent of them essential for our food security so this is not a typo this is a deliberate use of the word essential they are not helpful they're essential so with projection of changing climate and the increasing number of pests and diseases that um, crops suffer from these the genetic diversity is truly essential to keep keep our food security at the same time within this number of 70%, there is a huge under, um, under sampling in, in seed banks. So a lot of those crop wild relatives were really um, underrepresented heavily. So this is what this big project, crop wild relatives project was supposed to change. And it focused on 25 most important and most endangered crop species. Um, the sampling, um, was conducted in about 29 different countries around the world. And in total, um, in total they collected um, about 4,800 accessions that belong to almost 400 different species of wild relatives. And they were deposited in local gene banks as much as they were in Millennium Seed Bank in, here in the UK. Um, so this is as much for the introduction and actually a marketing campaign for, for my colleagues at Q because this has nothing to do with me. I just wanted to tell you important facts that I think um, everyone should know. So in general, my own interests revolve mostly about Asian rice and potatoes and about their crop relatives. So I'll be talking a little bit about those. So um, first thing to understand is that the reason why we want to conserve um, all these species and collect all those seeds in seed banks is because crop wild relatives are under huge threat, just like many other uh, wild species are. 
the threat mostly comes from us humans and one of them indirectly uh, by humans would be um, the climate change and so the changing um, changing conditions for growth of these plants uh, land use change which with leading factors being urbanization in agriculture um, but also deforestation direct exploitation invasive alien species here um, wink to catherine um, they, they they are very important um, contributor to, to extinction of, of, of um, plant species around the world and pollution and as much as um, the authors of this particular publication and this beautiful figure had in mind most likely pollution as in um, fertilizer pollution or CO2 pollution and so on, there's one other factor that's been usually not investigated as much, which is the genetic pollution. So as much as most wild relatives, um, sorry, most wild species do not suffer from that risk, crop wild relatives have tremendous pressure from their cultivated species that will in, in, um, impact them with their uh, gene flow. So um, these anthropogenic drivers um, lead to beginning of what we call known as um, the extinction vortex, where we, we start having lower um, or sorry, higher demographic stochasticity and environmental stochasticity, which in turn leads to smaller population size, both census and effective population size and shrinking habitat, which means slower distribution, which then leads to um, higher genetic stochasticity which will uh, then lead to higher effect of genetic drift and genetic erosion, higher inbreeding, and generally that will lead to lower genetic diversity and lower efficacy of selection, which in turn will lead to lower adaptability and lower fitness of plant populations, which then feed the vortex all over again. So there is this loop of doom uh, really hanging um, above our heads. So I think that um, crop wild relatives are very interesting um, models for um, studying this um, extinction vortex, but there is one very big issue. We don't really have an amazing knowledge of what a real wild relative is. So I'm here priming you to understand that this genetic pollution is truly a very strong factor in um, why these uh, crop wild relatives are threatened. Ah, here. Um, so I will describe this issue on, on the apple of rice. So rice is a very nice species. It feeds, or maybe feeds is a, a little bit dramatic. It, it gives a majority of calories um, a day for over half of the global population. And it has a series of, of uh, wild relatives. Some of them belong to the same clade, which is called normally AA genome. Uh, and there is actually two different cultivated species here, Oriza sativa, so Asian rice, Oriza uh, glabarima, African rice, and series of um, wild relatives, uh, Rufipogon, Nivara, Barthiae, Glumipatula, Meridionalis, and one more, which is not mentioned in this paper, which is uh, Longistaminata. And then there is, of course, other uh, clades in the genus Oriza, such as uh, the DD genomes, or so CC and DD genomes, which are mostly growing in, in, in the Americas. And so if we look at the distribution of Oriza sativa, so the cultivated plant now, it's truly a global cultivar or global crop. Um, its origins are in East Asia, this much we know from both genetic and archaeological evidence. But there is also secondary diversity hotspot, which is in South Asia, and the third one, which is in uh, Malay Archipelago. However, rice, long, long time ago, already migrated to Europe, Africa, and more in contemporary times in, in the span of uh, last 500 years when Spaniards took rice to uh, South America, they've become a very popular um, food crop there as well. So then if we look at the GBIF database and see where are the occurrences of the closest wild relatives, so Ariza rufipogon, which is also a uh, presumed um, ancestral species to the cultivated plant, you will see that it overlaps with where the tradition of rice cultivation existed for thousands of years. But then you will also see a huge concentration of that 
species in South America where it definitely does not belong. And I particularly find that puzzling and I'll come back to that a little later. There is another AA genome species, which is Oryza glumipatula, that actually uh, is its native range is in, in South America, in, in the Amazons and in the savannas or pampas. Okay, so why why do I uh, why am I so pessimistic with rice? Um, this is mostly due to one incredible publication um, from from Hong Ruang and uh, from uh, collaborators from uh, California, namely. Um, uh, Rasmus Nielsen, who conducted really interesting um, analysis in which they wanted to study wild populations of rice using already published data, but they looked at it a little bit differently. So they looked at each region separately. And then in the green bar here, you will see the cultivated plants and in the black here, the wild plants. And so if we, for example, look at um, the region of China, and you will see that the cultivated plants there usually have this blue component in this structure plot. And then there is a huge proportion of um, wild rice um, accessions that actually have about 50% of ancestry shared with those um, cultivated um, rice varieties. But that's not where the problem ends. Across the whole board, you will see variable amount of um, admixture that our ancestry that's shared with the cultivated plant. And the same story goes in every single of these regions. So of course, people now can argue that this might be some complex population structure. There might be some incomplete lineage sorting going on, but they went a little bit deeper into the problem. Oop, sorry. And they looked at particular genes that are known to be associated with um, domestication syndrome. So domestication syndrome is a series of traits that are very important for plants to be cultivated by humans. So they adapt them to agriculture, basically. And one particularly important is shattering. If you have a wild plant, of course, it wants to shatter their seeds so that it can propagate. But in cultivation regime, you would want to harvest the whole plant with seeds attached to the ear, and then only worry about retrieving the seeds um, from the stalk later. So this particular gene, which is called SH4, is responsible for keeping seeds on the plant. And when they looked at the signatures of um, genetic diversity in the genomic region where this gene sits, they noticed that there is a drop of genetic diversity in the cultivars, which is um, usually um, interpreted as a uh, selection sweep, which means this gene was under heavy selection. And so there is a um, low uh, the genome. But when they looked at a lot of those um, relatives, they noticed that they also have these selective seeds. Now, that doesn't really make sense for a plant that wants to propagate. It would make sense for a plant that is under cultivation. So they concluded that indeed a lot of those um, a lot of those wild plants have been um, touched by um, um, cultivated uh, species and contaminated genetically. Um, right. Um, so um, then I wanted to look at it a little bit deeper in that I have a little bit of understanding of, of, of um, rice cultivation traditions. This is uh, what I've been doing in the past um, maybe three years. And so I knew of particular interest in po pocket population that might shed a little bit more light on the problem. And so for instance, if we look at the distribution of um, Oryza rufipogon in here, you will notice that its um, native range is somewhat still um, um, disrupted. And in particular, you will see that there is not much happening around in Indonesia, but then Rufipogon is back on the map in Northern Australia and Papua New Guinea. And indeed in Papua New Guinea, we know that there's been populations of this wild, uh, wild species for a very long time. However, if you look at the map of Oriza sativa, you will notice that this uh, particular island has not been incredibly popular um, for rice eaters. And so indeed, if we look at um, cultures and traditions of Papua New Guinea, they never include rice dishes and they never had tradition of rice cultivation. So the hope among people was that, you know, maybe we can get our true wild relative from the island of Papua New Guinea. After all, there is no rice cultivation happening there 
commercially and it's very, very niche. So what I did is I first took the resequencing data for uh, four different individuals of Papua New Guinea, and I carried what is known as um, Patterson's D statistic um, or um, Ababa test or population F4 statistic. There is multiple um, common names for that. And what this it does is if you take four different populations and you arrange them phylogenetically in that you, you put how you think they are related to one another, then you can test whether this tree has support in the data or maybe there is some more complex story behind it. So in this particular case, I build a tree which to me made a lot of sense. We have the outgroup, then we have two different populations of Rufi Pogon, one from China, one from Papua New Guinea, and then finally, a cultivated rice, Japonica type, the one that was domesticated in China. And so indeed, this is the best suiting topology, but it still cannot explain the entire complexity of this very small problem. Um, according to the statistic with, with a lot of significance, there was a gene flow happening from um, Oriza sativa into this uh, population in Papua New Guinea. So then I went step forward and I asked for a full genome assembly of this particular um, representative of this particular population from PNG, from my collaborators um, from Rod Wing's lab. And so they had a whole institute of rice research to establish which individual in Rufi Pogon represents the best the wild state. They made a reference genome for that individual and I still picked up a um, signal of introgression or, or genetic contamination from Oriza sativa to the point where I actually found a single genomic region in this, in this, um, in this genome that is heavily um, similar to what's been going on in, in the cultivated rice. So with that in mind, we can go on and look at the wild relatives that are a little bit less related to um, um, Oriza sativa. So we, we, we've been working with Rufi Pogon for now. So let's move out and let's look at um, Oriza gloomy patula. So again, gloomy patula is the species that is uh, supposedly its native range is only in South um, America. But as I showed before, there is this suspicious indications of being Rufi Pogon being in the same vicinity, even though it's not supposed to be. And I have a theory that it indeed has a single origin of a problem where um, this Oriza Rufi Pogon comes in the shape of a feralized um, cultivated rice. So I did a very similar test to what I described before. And I looked at um, Gloomy Patula this time. And again, without any surprise, I had discovered an enormous amount of um, introgression coming from cultivated rice. So where is this coming from? I was thinking there might be two different reasons why these um, individuals get contaminated genetically. It could actually be happening in situ to the fact that we do cultivate rice for thousands of years, or in some cases for 500 years next to its wild relatives. Or it could be that we're sequencing um, contemporary material from seed banks, and the contamination is actually happening ex situ where you're uh, capturing both um, wild species and cultivated species, and you need to regenerate seeds every odd years. And so there is a lot of room for them to talk to each other. So the only sure way to actually check whether uh, it was really happening ex situ or in situ is through um, sampling of, of, of herbaria and sequencing the genomes of these herbaria specimens. So, um, for a whole month that I've been a PI, I started a project in um, which I am utilizing a, a huge resources of herbaria um, to sequence um, um, their genome without risk of any ex situ contamination. Because you collect the plant, you put it on a paper, and you don't worry. You don't have a risk of contamination coming from um, poly cross pollination anymore. So I have. Um, or Riza Rufi Pogon from Papua New Guinea, but also all across the board, um, Oriza Meridionalis, um, Oriza Gloomy Patula, and Oriza Rufi Pogon that was collected from South America, and in Africa, also um, Oriza Langstaminata and um, Oriza um, Bartii. So for now, I collected 300 samples um, in total. And I wanted to talk now two slides, and I promised I'll say something about the methods. Um, about how, how you approach this problem. It's not as easy as with fresh material. It's not that you can just walk in 
to herbarium, take some sample and sequence it. It's actually a little bit more complicated, but technically with um, recent advances, it's really okay. So just like ancient DNA from bones in herbaria, uh, plants also suffer from degradation of their DNA. So there's two main processes that cause that, and it's a depurination, which causes the break of the DNA backbone, which then makes your DNA being very fragmented, right? So instead of having this 100 kilo basis fragments of DNA that can go to packed bio, you, you get stuck with something like, you know, median of 60 base pairs um, is, is your fragment size. So this is a part, like a single Arabidopsis toliana herbarium specimen shown in here, which is of course not ideal for some technologies, but it's really well suited for technologies such as short read sequencing. So when you look at this fragmentation and then um, uh, a, a, a um, colleague of mine from Max Planck um, looked at it in, in, in a lot of details, he actually found out that the, the, the fragmentation of DNA in herbarium material uh, um, occurs six times faster than when you compare it to, to bones of particular bird, because only for this bird they had uh, temporal samplings. Um, so it's really fast. Um, then you also have deamination, so a switch from cytosine through hydrolytic attack on the amine group that um, ends you up with uracil. And then whenever you use a polymerase that's insensitive to uracil, you change it to thymine. So hence we call it C2T substitutions. I think Catherine also referred to that in her, her talk, and it commonly looks like this. So you have more C2T substitutions in the beginning of the molecules. So it has its disadvantages, but it also has its advantages. We can use that to authenticate that our DNA is truly ancient or historical. So how do we do it technically? Um, there is two popular ways to do it. Um, one is a very plant-oriented method, which is the CTAB uh, method with, um, um, with uh, combined with um, isolation on columns, which is also a very commonly known DNEZ kit. So you basically mix a little bit of CTAP with a little bit of um, DNEZ. The other one is more oriented towards ancient DNA and it requires a, a lysis in the PTB buffer. So that's something that people were using in ancient DNA uh, field for a while. So when I um, benchmarked it with some of my colleagues, it, we, we looked at the size distribution and damage of um, molecules we can extract with these two methods. PTB was a clear winner that managed to extract shorter molecules than CTAB. And PTB also managed to extract more damaged molecules compared to CTAB. So then if we want to sequence this DNA, what we would usually do is we would look at short fragments of DNA that span particular region in the genome. And I just want to use this opportunity to tell you to never take PCR approach, because if you do that, then you're masking all these C2T substitutions and basically do not allow yourself to authenticate your, your, your DNA, whether your DNA is truly ancient or whether it's modern DNA. So instead, we can use the shotgun ligation approach that is compatible with uh, uh, next generation sequencing or short read sequencing on Illumina platforms. And it has this advantage also that it allows us to really sample the whole distribution of fragments and we don't waste any material from valuable uh, from valuable sources. Okay, so just in, in three words, I wanted to say where else I want to take that research. And I was wondering whether there is something I can contribute towards the understanding of this extinction vortex that I mentioned before. And I think there is a lot of interesting questions associated with this extinction vortex, but a lot of them are actually fairly um, well uh, dealt with. So for example, the way we can measure both through cross coalescent modeling or just having temporal sampling, we can fairly simply um, <clears throat> measure the changes in population sizes, even in effective population sizes or in distribution using, um, using um, geo coordinates of uh, observations of plants in the wild. Um, it's also not that difficult to measure drift are, are in breeding coefficient and definitely not so difficult to measure genetic diversity. And we can also do it how it changes in time when we have temporal sampling from herbaria. But what I find particularly appealing and difficult to study is, is to see the adaptability in this context. So in other words, I would like to understand how is the adaptability in crop wild relatives changing um, in time as their niche is dramatically um, going down, their population sizes are going down and so on. 
So to that end, and um, I need to put a caveat, it's not really per se adaptability, but at least we can study the genetic associations with the environment and try to quantitatively answer the question, how strongly are genomes or mutations in these genomes associated with particular environments in general? And so here I wanted to show an example of, of my work where I um, used such an approach with uh, great help of, of um, Jesse Lasky, whom the other uh, two participants of this call know very well, and, and um, Emily Bellis, um, his postdoc, who helped us uh, um, do this um, in RISE, where we have uh, in this picture about 400 land races of uh, Japonic rice grown around. And we took um, their genomes and wanted to understand relatedness between these samples. And we did so um, using genetic information. But then we also used this uh, very nice method called RDA to see how different linear combination of SNPs um, uh, are, uh, uh, are associated with different linear combination of environmental variables. And so I'll cut it short here and say that not only you can use that to track which particular variables um, will contribute towards the genetic differentiation of different uh, subpopulations, but it also allows you to have a bulk quantification of how strongly um, some things uh, uh, contribute to, to genetic associations with the environment. So I want to use this uh, to answer a, a few interesting, I hope, questions, which are, um, if we take wild relatives that we know are true, so we didn't find any contamination from, from um, the cultivated uh, plants some 50 years ago, and then we do that also um, for plants that were 100 years ago, do their association with an um, environment changes? And in this particular case, my hy hypothesis would be that it will be uh, going down, so their association will be lower. Uh, and then for me, an interesting question is also, what will the uh, association with our environment look like in those contaminated wild relatives? So it might be the case that you know, crop plants actually in, in a way are a savior that, you can, that can pull you out from that, um, from that um, extinction vortex by introducing more genetic diversity, by introducing more adaptations. I find that particularly unappealing of a, a picture, but I want to test it anyway. So finally, I just want to very briefly um, acknowledge a, uh, many, many people, but they can be grouped in, in, in few groups. So for all my ancient DNA works and skills, I want to thank Hernan Urbano and his lab in Max Planck uh, in Tübingen for my rice works, uh, my uh, recent supervisor, Michael Purgan at NYU and incredible collaborator, Jesse at PSU, and for uh, help with current works, um, Orna Balama. And thank you for listening. Thanks so much for such a neat presentation. Um, if someone has like a quick question, we can go ahead and do that. I think the analysis of like the one that you did with Emily and with Jesse is super neat because it puts so many elements together. Um, I think that's super, super helpful. If nobody has a question, then I guess this is it. Thanks so much for showing up today. Thanks again, Catherine and Rafael for being here and spending the time showing us your amazing work. And it was truly a pleasure. So take care, everyone, and stay safe. Just gonna...